United States of America. Our special guest today is the Jewish lesbian folk singer Frank. Howdy. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Well, I'm glad. Would you like to start off with a uh, tune? Uh, all right. <laughs> Natalie Wood is dead and so is William Holder. Natalie Wood is dead and so is William Holder. Natalie Wood is dead and so is Bill Holder. They both had had some cocktails just before they died. They both had had some cocktails just before they died. Bill had quite a bit, not just half a glass of wine. And was it just a coincidence? Was it just a coincidence? Was it just a coincidence? They both weren't found for quite some time. They both were wearing clothes that Edith had designed. One died on land and one died at sea. One died on land and one died at sea. Pray for poor RJ, pray for poor Stephanie. William Holden has gone to the great safari in the sky. And Natalie Wood is safe down at King Neptune's side. And just remember what their friend Dana Andrews said. If it hadn't been for alcohol, Nat and Bill would not be dead. Natalie Wood is dead and so is William Holden. Natalie Wood is dead and so is William Holden. Natalie Wood is dead and so is Bill Holden. I need a drink really bad now. <laughs> 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 I would immediately go to a bar afterwards. We'll have some hardcore tea here, Tosh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> mm. You don't drink, do you? The mighty brew. Oh, no, I'm abstaining. Oh, great. Wow. That's very interesting. Are you a William Holden and Natalie Wood fan normally? Or oh, a uh, uh, big fan of that. Well, did they die around the same Matt time? Matt and Bill. Oh, yes, within uh, weeks, if not days, oh, I, those, I believe. It's one of those threes, Daph. Yeah, it was one of those. Yeah. That's horrible. Okay, well, are you a big uh, newspaper reader in the morning? Uh, pretty much. I tried to subscribe at one point, and uh -huh. what happened was I found when I was subscribing, I wasn't really reading. I was doing a lot more stacking <laughs> of paper than reading. But uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I have that my, I have that problem myself. But then I find when I go to the actual news rack mm -hmm. or the you know and buy the paper, mm -hmm. put that quarter in the machine that I have a lot more appreciation for the material than I'm reading. You know, it's funny because I feel that way too. Mm -hmm. It's When you get it in the, by mail or service, it doesn't yeah. seem... Well, subscriptions are neat. Now, I think it's good to get subscriptions as gifts. Uh-huh. You know, and that's, somebody just gave me a subscription to Harper's, which I would never give to myself. I read Harper's. Interesting. Very, it's a very good, yeah. It is a good publication. They have little, little blurbs of other, Interesting other magazines. Interesting stuff in there, yeah. And uh, yeah, just thinking of magazines and subscriptions. I haven't had a subscription to a magazine since uh, friends of my parents gave me a subscription to Seventeen when I was uh, growing <laughs> up. Right? And I was at this party uh, about a week and a half uh -huh. ago, and uh, Rodney Bingenheimer introduced me to the editor of Seventeen. I was just so thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was it uh, Gloria? Um, whatever, I think so. She yeah. was wearing kind of a fancy sweatsuit, I think. Yeah, she's been in business for years. Yeah. I mean, for the Cassidy's, for the 
Polly yeah, Bear. Yeah, Tiger Beat and Tiger Beat. she do yeah. all of those, yeah. She served the William Randolph Hearst of the teen market. She's gnarly. She controlled them and she broke them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great, you know. Glad I'm not Kirk Cameron today, right? <laughs> no, it's funny because like when I go get a newspaper, right, mm -hmm. it feels important going to a newsstand and getting a newspaper. And yeah, when I'm traveling, I like to, I like to get I like the local to, yeah. papers. It's really nice. And I always like to get foreign magazines to read on the toilet. That's like oh, absolutely. Yeah, so. Do you have like a little magazine rack? No, I don't. I need one. I <laughs> If you have a rack, send it to me. <laughs> I'm um, going to get one for $2. Yeah? But I can't tell you because I can't advertise the store. All right, here. well, we'll discuss it after. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share secrets. We've already talked clothes here. So. <laughs> okay, what I want to know is um, when, you first, when I first heard of you, it was Reading Slash Magazine. Your Way name, back your when. Picture. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you were in a band called Nervous Gender at mm -hmm. the time, um, which I, I, don't, I, never saw, I never saw Nervous Gender. They I don't made know an incredible amount of noise. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hear. I heard it was like sort of a noise. Noise band. Torturous. Torturous. So what was the transition from noise band to folk singer? I mean, how, well, I had always kind about? of been a folk singer. Uh-huh. And uh, I had played the women coffee house kind of, there wasn't really a circuit then, but there was a women's coffee house in town and I would play for, uh, I grew up in the, in the women's community in LA mm -hmm. and I did most of my performing there. Then I moved to San Francisco and I, uh, you know, found punk rock and it was like when the the Avengers were just starting mm -hmm. and the um, Pistols were just coming over, mm -hmm. you know, right after the New Year and uh, things got wild and then I moved back down to LA and I joined, I, w I just wanted to be in a band really mm -hmm. bad, mm -hmm. that craving. <laughs> so I, like I, and I went out to all shows all the time mm -hmm. by myself, just, I, mean, I didn't know anybody and I would just go and uh, Edward from Nervous Gender just, you know, we bumped into each other at a show and you know, he liked the way I looked, so he asked me if I wanted to sing for his band. You never met this person before? No, no. That's great. And I said, sure, great, you know. And, and did you so look? we did it, and it was synthesizers. Gosh, I'd never seen a synthesizer before in my life. <laughs> it was very weird music, but, you know, you I got up it? there and I screamed, and no, I played it, you know, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Were you the singer? Um, we all sang and we all played. Uh huh. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and there's no recordings of Nervous Gender. Are there any mm. bootlegs or? Uh, there's some recordings, I think, of Nervous Gender on subterranean records, but they, I'm not on them. Oh, I see. After I left the band, you were in, a, you were in two other bands before then? Uh, I was in Catholic Discipline and um, Castration Squad, which is kind of a silly little band that did cover of Cruella de Vil. That was quite good. <laughs> uh, some of that name makes me nervous a little bit. Great know. name, but the band had no politics, so, you know, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't shudder if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> but they love to print that, you know, it's the big lesbian was an castration squad. You know, that's the way you were approached, like you're always in front of the photograph of the rest of the band, and your image, I mean, I noticed you, I noticed you right away in the with, photograph. With like a Slash what Magazine. Photo? I think oh, it was Nervous oh, Gender. You know, it wasn't, it was a, yeah, a photo with Nervous Gender. And they always played with your, the gender, you know, your gender. Yeah, well, you know, it's a good name for the band. Uh, I, I, said, I, knew, I knew you were a girl, I knew right yeah. away I would get the picture, didn't fool me. Yes. <laughs> I enjoy being a girl. So you were a folk singer before? Yep. Uh, I started playing uh, Jewish folk songs at my grandfather's sukkahs when uh -huh. I was 14. Huh. I got to be the entertainment there. Cause we used to have uh, Israeli folk singers, uh -huh. Jewish entertainment, come every year for sukkahs and he'd have that uh, large number of people in the, in the carport uh -huh. with uh, various fruits and vegetables <laughs> hanging. <laughs> <laughs> they go around, drive around Beverly Hills getting palm fronds to put <laughs> over the top of the carport, you know, to make the suckers. So uh, that's when I started doing it, and then I kind of progressed, and I went kind of wild, and mm -hmm. was a nervous gender, and then I was in Catholic Discipline, which is the first time I ever really played electric guitar, mm. and I really enjoyed that. That was, I was the only woman in that band, and that was, that was much more of a band band, yeah. you know, uh -huh. and I loved that band. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great, you know, and I had a great time in there, and I worked really hard to play the guitar, and you know, mm -hmm. I practiced a lot, and, and, uh, and I would have stayed in that band, but that band, it, it kind of just dissolved. Claude, who, uh, in Kick Boy Face, Claude Bessie, oh, yeah. who's well. living over in England now, uh -huh. and has been over there for quite a while, he had just moved, he let, wanted to move back home. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, uh, he and Philomena, Philomena was from England, and he's from France, and they wanted to move back, so they left, and other people had, you know, everyone had their own obligations to other bands. Like everyone that was in Catholic Discipline was in at least two or three other bands at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of, everyone dispersed. And I had already started playing, I think I had done one show alone mm -hmm. 
you know, I shot Club 88 with Human Hands and Johanna Went. Oh yeah, friends and with Monitor yeah. I think played that night too. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that was the night that I did take other swastikas and uh, and then ever since then, right about 1980, I think I played the first time. And then just describe what happened, like the swastikas uh, song. The oh, it's just. Uh, Going out to a lot of clubs and things, seeing a lot of kids wearing swastikas. Mm -hmm. Being Jewish, you know, really bothered me. And uh, so I wrote this song called Take Off Your Swastikas, which was just my return to playing acoustic because it was just me and my guitar. It was mm -hmm. a protest song. And uh, it, you know, it went over well. I felt really good about doing it. Mm -hmm. The reaction was very positive. And so I continued playing solo, addressing all kinds. Like I wrote that song about Natalie. And, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I address topics that are, you know, very serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then, you know, some that, you know, quite. A, I mean, I'm, I was fans of Bill and Nat, but you know, <laughs> I can see the irony and <laughs> and a bit of it there. Um, uh, people ask me a lot if, uh, you know, if I switched audiences, you know, if I want to switch to a folk audience or whether I think I'm getting. I was going to ask you about that. Audience. I was thinking about, about switching, but mostly about. Um, uh, playing in front of a punk audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, They've totally. always been my audience. They yeah. were there for me in the beginning mm -hmm. and they stuck with me. You know, so I... I uh, They're a great audience, aren't wonderful they? Wonderful audience. I think, uh, especially that period in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, or late 70s, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, I found that more, the audience was more open to anything. Very open, real honest, you know. Yeah, do you find it sort of closed now? Um, it's changing. Not for you, because I see you play it's a It's changing, but I yeah. still try to play to as diverse crowds as possible. Huh. I think it's the best way for me to reach as many people as possible. Uh -huh. you know, I find if I want to reach some subcultures, I have to play specifically to them. Mm -hmm. like, uh, if I want to play to a women's uh, audience, I have to go to a women's festival or play a women's show. Can you can you explain what what is a woman's audience or a woman's show exactly? Oh, it's just a show where like uh, there's a number of uh, there's a couple of festivals that happen during the year. There's the uh, Michigan Women's Music Festival, uh -huh. which is in its 11th or 12th year, and last year I think there were like 6,000 women, and it's on women-owned land, and it's a women-produced and women musicians, women do all the technical work. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, it encompasses all aspects of uh, women in music, and from workshops to performing. And They've got sta uh, three stages, I think, and mm -hmm. stages that, that go on during the day, and then they have an evening stage, and they have workshops about music and politics, and it's pretty interesting. So when you do a show for like a woman, wo for, for women only, or women's yeah. audience, there's men there, right? No men? No men. No men. At the festivals. Some women shows, you know, are uh, not women only, but yeah, in this festival situation, anyway. it's all women. Well, do they, um, do you, uh, do you hone your show down to like this for women? I mean, is it different no. from when... No, it's the same show. Same in a show. Sense. And they ask me, the women ask me the same thing. Do you change your show when you go out and play for a straight <laughs> audience? Or that? I said, no, it's the same show. Well, as a TV host, I just asked these. Well, that's TV a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> it is. Okay, what is what is your uh, what is this thing about Thomas Noguchi? What about him? <laughs> what a character, eh? Tom, are you out there teaching cooking? <laughs> I think he's a cook <clears throat> show on public access now. Does he? I heard rumors. He got that. his own show. I think he's so right. it's I Tom think and Yan. I think it's after this show. <laughs> It isn't. Yeah, he cuts some type of weird type of meat. I don't know what it is. I don't. Know. <laughs> You're being so facetious. He no. should have his own show. He's a gourmet cook, you know. You're kidding. The gourmet <laughs> Japanese cook. He teaches gourmet <laughs> Japanese cooking in the San Fernando Valley. He has cooking classes, and I'm being serious. <laughs> well, you don't think I'm being this serious? Is true. <laughs> Where is he? If he's right outside that door, I'll believe you. I get to shake Tom? his hand. <laughs> if I get to shake that hand, the hand that has cut so many. So what? 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 Why do you find him so interesting? Well. Uh, I find that anyone that gets like kind of a, a total media blitz like that—that's mm -hmm. a little bit unusual. I, I find you know it's interesting. Do you see him as more of a showbiz character or as a doctor? Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely a showbiz character. I also see him. You know, I, I make fun of him a little bit in the song, but I do think that I think he was a wild guy. But I think he had you know the people didn't like that he had such a big mouth. Mm. They didn't like that he kind of told the truth and knew what was really going on and would mm -hmm. let too much out. So I think that, you know, his firing was perhaps he was careless, but perhaps, you know, he just had too big a mouth. He was just letting a little bit too mm -hmm. much out to the real world, mm -hmm. which made it unsafe for, you know, I don't, those people. No, oh, he was those people. Well, he, I probably should mention he was the uh, chief coroner of Los Angeles, Los Angeles yeah. for years. And performed autopsies on all the, the big stars. All the big ones. John and, and, he, and he's, 
he got a little carried away, I think. He, he got quoted as saying things like, you know, he was really thrilled when, when Bobby Kennedy got shot because, or we would like <laughs> pray for like an, an airplane to crash so he would, you know, get some publicity. And like his big <laughs> coup was RFK, you know. And then after that, you know, Marilyn and Stars Through the Ages. But I think he really has been honest with the public. I have a relative who's a hairdresser. Uh -huh. Does his hair? Did Robert Kennedy's hair the day he got shot. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? It is really amazing. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> we should change your <laughs> true stories with Todd. <laughs> There's nothing but truth here anyway. <laughs> really? That's pretty neat. Well, did That's you read his book? Yes. Actually, I like the first one. and. Corner. He, wrote, he wrote another one? Yes, wrote, Corner 2. You wrote Corner 2? <laughs> yeah, corner 2. Now you're putting I had, it on. No, I'm not. <laughs> I bought it in the airport, and I left it in the pocket of the airplane seat in front of me because it was just really bad, and I thought someone else might enjoy it. It's just, the books I find to be a little disappointing. Yeah. I would much rather see him do like a video docudrama and talk in his own little way. Well, that show, what's that show? It's based on him. Quincy? Yeah, it is based is on him. Is it not him. based on yeah, him? it sure is. Seth uh, Jack Klugman doesn't look exactly no, the same. No, but you've got Robert Ito in there. <laughs> he's well, the, you he's are a, a fan. He's the brains behind it anyway. Robert Ito, Sam, you know. Sam, Sam behind the microscope. Okay, you have toured through uh, Europe. Uh, through England and France. Okay, England and France. Now, especially in France, was there like a language problem or just a cultural? France was kind of interesting. I was on tour with the Pogues, uh -huh, who are an Irish uh -huh. folk band. And uh, we did, I did five dates in France with them. And I don't know if it was a, maybe there was a language barrier. My record wasn't really out yet in France. They hadn't mm. really done much to publicize mm -hmm. me yet in France. And so it was uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. The small towns like in Lyon and, and Rennes, uh, the shows there were really wonderful. In Paris, um, it was just like 2,500 drunken French people wanting to see the Pogues real bad, so when I was on stage, mm -hmm. I found little wads of paper on fire, like sailing past my wow. head, fireballs and a lot of raucous, you know, <laughs> French wow. kind of. I'm not surprised I'm about that. About no, <laughs> it was uh, an interesting experience, though. Uh, the, the smaller clubs and the smaller mm -hmm. audiences were really, really warm, and those shows went ra rather well, but uh, I'm sure there was the language barrier, um, although I sat backstage and talked to someone, I mean, in like pig I'm pigeon French and pigeon English mm -hmm. about everything from TV to history mm -hmm. backstage. And I really enjoy traveling because you get a chance to really mm. talk to a lot of people, find out like, you know, the way they grew up, how they went to school, what they yeah, were taught. Very and it's really, it? it's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, but, so France was, you know, it was different. Mm. It was very different. Really pretty. So they, they, they the audience understood what you were singing about. Or Sometimes, uh -huh. it's it seemed like they did at the at the smaller shows. It really and did. do you because some of your songs are real sort of local and topical. Yeah, like uh, Gucci or uh, right. Well, I I didn't did I do the Gucci only tour? I didn't do it a whole lot. Not unless uh -huh. people really requested it. Like in the English audiences, I did more of the, and I spent a lot of time uh, when I play outside of the country, especially explaining the origins of the song, mm -hmm. so people really know what they're hearing mm -hmm. about because it it is. Uh, very local. If mm -hmm. you know, if you're here, I don't have to explain anything. Mm -hmm. You get all the jokes. Mm -hmm. But uh, so you have no translator on the no. other side. At the, of the, the women's festivals, <laughs> I do have really uh, sign. Yeah, very they always they always have uh, sign interpreters. Okay, now when I listen to your first rec your record, you only have one album out, the right. folk singer. Another one soon to come. Great. Um, I really don't know anything about your background. You know, I, didn't, I didn't read any press uh, releases or anything, but I got a sense of. Um, you're very health conscious. Uh, not health conscious, but like very, you, you admire uh, bodies. Oh, I admire, like Amazon. I have like Amazons as a tribute to sports women. And it's not, really like, it's not really like a sexual thing, but it's also like a really like a health, vital yeah, life. Well, yeah, like those women jocks are pretty great, <laughs> yeah. I, I think what kind of swayed me there is I have always admired athletes. Mm -hmm. and I've always been kind of a, I wouldn't say a mediocre one, but I have to work real hard to be anywhere near good. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, I swim on a swim team. Which I was is ask you about another that. one of the songs on that record is called One of the Girls. Uh -huh. And um, that really, gosh, you know, I'm forever indebted to swimming. It really changed my life a lot. And how? I was going to ask you. How? Um, well, it did make me more health conscious, but it gave me more of a perspective of 
the real world mm -hmm. and fitting into the real world, that mm -hmm. real straight, some kind, you know, blonde, surfer kind of California world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd always been kind of a loner mm -hmm. and uh, kind of on the outside in the, in the outer subcultures. And mm -hmm. uh, here I was, like in this mainstream California college kind of. Mm -hmm. on the swim team with all these kind of regular folks that uh -huh. were really, you know, we had a lot in common and a lot not in common. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of differences were very apparent. And it was really quite an education. These people became like a family to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just was a lot of breaking down of stereotypes. But when you swim with someone, when you're on a team, uh, the workouts are so intense. You spend so much time together. You can't help but get to know you know, really what people really like. Mm -hmm. I mean, like all the surface crap is just really pushed out of the way and it's a, it's a real bonding experience. So uh, it just it was real eye-opening for mm -hmm. me and uh, I think for them too and it was a real educational experience. And plus it got me really healthy and uh, gave me a, a real like team spirit and, and a real sense of you family. You feel like one of the girls. Exactly. <laughs> can, really you, great. can you do another song? Should I do one of the girls? I think that's how appropriate. Hey, let's, let's do that one. That's my favorite one, anyway, I must say.
I'm one of the girls. 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 Great. <laughs> Okay, do you want to have a comic book based on your life, like the adventures oh, of Frank? That would be great. Me, like Actually, I would like to have a movie made with Patty Duke as my mother. You know? Maybe it could be arranged, yeah. AMLA. Yeah, well. I'm going to get you together. I, I love Patty Duke. She, I just think she's, she's a genius. <laughs> genius is too small a word. <laughs> yeah, big genius. <laughs> he really is. Terrific. We'll have to say farewell now. Yeah? It's Tosh, it's been swell, and your tea's swell. great, really. Well, thank you very much. We take great pride in it. Uh, farewell, America, and uh, get well, Myra. Bye-bye. So long. <laughs>